marvelous to be here and, and to uh, engage this enormously, enormously important topic. And I think the fact that uh, there are so many people in this audience indicates that uh, even those folks who are uh, optimistic by inclination realize that the issue of a global mega crisis, humanity's future this century, is something that needs to really be addressed and engaged with. The realization of the larger significance of the challenges human, humankind is facing. Uh, I, I want to say, though, that the, the difference between optimism and pessimism on this issue is, in, in, in terms of psychological temperament, is in some ways fundamentally determinative. How we see the world in the future is very deeply rooted in our psychological attitudes and biases. Uh, and those things are very difficult to address just through reasoned argumentation. So I expect, frankly, that when we do the vote again, it's, the proportions aren't going to change very much. Uh, and, and no matter how persuasive any of us are, are up here. Uh, additionally, I think we have to recognize that uh, when it comes to understanding humankind's prospects this century, uh, we are faced with a, a, a situation of truly <coughs> profound, intractable uncertainty. Bill talked about the fact that there is always uncertainty. We are, we are living in a world increasingly characterized by unknown unknowns, but we don't even know what questions to ask most of the time. We're ignorant of our own ignorance. And I think as our world becomes more complex in a, a number of respects, uh, this fundamental intractable uncertainty is uh, going to uh, increase, it's going to deepen. Now, I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing. I'll explain in a moment why. I think it, it actually it, it, it can contribute to some of our difficulties. But, but I also think that it's a cause for optimism. I was on stage a number of years ago with uh, a, a fellow who uh, was much more pessimistic than I, which is saying something. And, uh, uh, and I guess one of the audience members got up, this was in Ottawa, and asked, uh, is there any hope? And my partner on stage said, no, I don't think there is. <laughs> and I, I said, well, you know, the value of the fact of the, of, of the complexity, the enormous complexity of the social, ecological, economic, technological systems we're now embedded within is that we actually don't know whether there's no hope. And as long as we don't know, I'm going to presume there's at least some hope and get on with seeing what can be done to make the future for my very young children uh, uh, a better future, a future in which they can prosper. Uh, I think given all of that background, the intractable uncertainty that we face, uh, the, the the role of temperament, optimistic versus pessimistic temperament, in our assessment of the prospects for humankind and the likelihood of a global mega crisis. I think, in many respects, the debate that we've heard today has been very nicely summarized uh, as one, in its most simplistic labels, could be uh, described as a debate between techies and greens, uh, getting a little bit more sophisticated as a debate between uh, those who think that human innovation will triumph and those who think that we face fundamental limits to growth that, are, that cannot be breached through innovation. Getting yet a little bit more sophisticated, I think this is fundamentally, now we're starting to actually get into the world of, of deep values, understandings, and temperaments again, things that are very personal to us. I think this is fundamentally a debate between those who tend to privilege ideational causal factors and those who tend to privilege material causal factors, those who think that human mind can overcome virtually any obstacles, and those who think that external or exogenous environmental and structural factors are generally determinative in human affairs. Um, I would like to go one step further in terms of characterizing this study. Uh, I, I think in many respects, and as some of you may know, in a book that I wrote a number of years ago, The Ingenuity Gap, uh, it's worth characterizing this problem as uh, a challenge of delivering solutions to the problems we face when and where we need them. The problems are getting harder, so we have to deliver better solutions faster. 
Now, the question is, can we keep up? Uh, can we deliver those solutions when and where we need them? And we can get into a debate about what we mean by solutions, what it means for a problem to be solved, what it means for something to be a problem. All of those are worthwhile questions. Uh, I disaggregated this question into the problem of the requirement for ingenuity and the supply of ingenuity. The uh, argument was that our requirement for solutions uh, is going up. Our solutions need to be more complex. Uh, we need to deliver them faster. Uh, and the requirement is going up in part because of deep stresses that we're facing in our world that fundamentally challenge human prosperity, many of which you already heard about this afternoon. Uh, I won't go on with the issue of the requirement side. You can also then talk about the supply side. Are we able to keep up? Are we able to supply the ingenuity we need when and where we need it, the solutions we need? And I think there are at least four reasons why we face some pretty fundamental obstacles to keeping up. Uh, and again, I'm not going to elaborate. I put these in the category of brains, uh, cognitive factors, psychological factors that sometimes impede our ability to deliver the solutions we need when and where we need them, uh, difficulties or uh, impediments within our scientific and technological institutions, uh, market failures, so problems within our economic institutions, and then finally uh, issues and obstacles at the political level, especially relating to the structural power of vested interests that don't want to see any change in the status quo. And I would say that they're actually, for most of the challenges humankind faces that might contribute to a global mega crisis, there are actually very good solutions out there, vast numbers of them in many cases. Uh, but it's not the creation of the ideas that's a problem. It's the delivery and implementation of those ideas that's a problem. And that we have uh, just manifold institutional failures, uh, largely because of the role of these structural vested interests. Now, I won't elaborate too much further on that general perspective, but I would say that, that uh, I started my career sounding like uh, Rick and Michael, and I'm going to probably end my career sounding a lot more like Bill. Uh, um, as, uh, as Rick suggested, uh, I, I do think in some fundamental respect the challenge we face is most deeply rooted in our minds. So I'm shifting to the ideational side of that balance that I mentioned before. Uh, can we keep up? Can we deliver the ingenuity when and where we need it? Can we decrease our requirement for ingenuity by making our problems less di less difficult and also by increasing the supply of ingenuity. I think that uh, whether we can or not is going to depend to a large extent on luck. We have to hope that things break our way at various moments in the future. Uh, intractable uncertainty is going to unfold uh, over the course of this century as a series of uh, branching possibilities as we go into the future. Highly contingent moments where uh, perhaps the actions of a certain people or leader at a particular time can lead us down one pathway versus another pathway. Whether we uh, change uh, that relationship or balance between the material and the ideational uh, and choose more prosperous pathways, I think will probably ultimately depend on uh, five factors, which I'll mention very quickly. And you've heard about some of these already from the other presentations. I would say, by the way, that these five factors involve a fundamental reconfiguration of the relationship between the ideational and the material on our, on our planet, I would say that the deep problem that humankind faces is that that relationship is woefully out of balance. That our cultures, our economic institutions, uh, our consumption behaviors are, out of, uh, are mismatched uh, to our material environment, our energy availability, the nature of our climate, resource availability, etc., on what is increasingly seeming like a very small planet. But very quickly, in terms of sounding like Bill at the end, uh, I, I, I think, and, uh, but also a certain amount of Rick too, the, 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 the first challenge is to reconsider what we mean by the good life and to think about uh, our value orientation in this world. Now some people might think these things are unchangeable, that they're givens, but I think that history shows that there can be an enormous variety 
of beliefs and values relating to how we think of our, our futures, what we desire for our children, for our communities, uh, where we set the boundary of the community, the we and the they, uh, what our relationship is to the natural world. Those things we, we clearly need to uh, readdress and, and uh, consider a whole variety of alternatives to the dominant discourse of values and beliefs that are on the planet today. Uh, secondly, uh, to link to one of the ideas that was raised earlier, uh, we need to, in particular by Bill, we need to uh, dramatically increase the capacity of human beings to act smart when they're in large groups of people rather than increasingly stupidly as they get into larger and larger groups of people. In fact, you could say that as uh, human beings uh, act at the level of the species as a whole, uh, we have the, about the intelligence of a protozoa in a petri dish. Uh, you know, we're busy gobbling up our resources and poisoning ourselves with our excrement. The capacity of these new online and IT technologies to allow us finally to uh, recognize or realize something like collective intelligence on a global basis is something that could really be a game changer. Uh, and and uh, uh, that is a reason for optimism. We have technologies available that could achieve that that weren't available before. Those technologies, those online and IT technologies can also provide the, uh, for the third possibility, which is large-scale popular mobilization that could uh, act against those structural vested interests that are blocking uh, significant change and the delivery of significant solutions to the challenges we face. Uh, and fourthly, uh, the issue of energy is absolutely fundamental. And if we don't make major progress in developing uh, carbon-free sources of energy uh, soon, which would require very large-scale social investment, uh, then I think we are in deep, deep trouble this century, especially given that there's a close relationship between uh, the delivery of high-quality energy, large quantities of high-quality energy, and the ability of societies to sustain high levels of complexity, technological and institutional complexity. If our energy becomes much more costly this century, for whatever reason, then we're going to have much more difficulty, vastly more difficulty, delivering the solutions that we need to problems like climate change. Uh, and then, uh, finally, the, perhaps the most difficult and intractable problem of all, and the one that we have to address and come up with answers for, is uh, developing alternatives to our conventional model of economic growth, uh, uh, which is a high consumption, high material and energy throughput model of economic growth. And it would probably require advances in all of the previous, this particular challenge, developing alternatives to conventional economic growth, would require advances in the other four matters that I've highlighted, uh, value and belief change, reconsidering what we consider to be the good life, uh, mobilization of collective intelligence, uh, political mobilization against vested interests, and finally, uh, major progress in developing carbon-free energy. Now, uh, I think just to conclude that if we move in these areas, then there is a, a reasonable prospect that uh, Bill will be right ultimately by the end of the century, as opposed to Rick and Michael. But, uh, <laughs> but it's not by any means uh, determined one way or the other. There are an enormous number of choices in terms of social science language or lingo. Uh, there is an enormous opportunity for the, the, the engagement of agency as, we, as the century unfolds. Uh, we have some opportunities to actually choose a path for ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you.